everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, in which we're going to be speaking about the value of ESG, narrative ESG certification when it comes to business growth. The reason behind this webinar is essentially that we've been hearing from the BGF portfolio that having a credible narrative is obviously important, but how do you actually go about it? In my role as the head of ESG and sustainability, I've had the opportunity to speak to different companies across different sectors, and it always comes down to this worry that if we are having an ESG narrative, is it going to be perceived as greenwashing? But at the same time, we've seen that businesses who are doing this really well are unlocking a huge opportunity for themselves. For example, they are able to attract customers, they're able to retain employees, simply because when they think about their ESG strategy, they also think about what is the real narrative that we're trying to build? How do we actually demonstrate that the way that we are managing our ESG risks and opportunity is credible? And how do we then leverage this to attract additional funding, have stronger growth, or have an overall stronger strategy in itself? We know that this is a slightly complicated sort of topic right now because we are still building the language around this. We're still building the certifications around this. But we have seen certifications like B Corp become quite important over the last couple of years, which we hope to tackle in this uh, webinar itself. Just a, a mention for all the attendees that you can send across your questions to myself, but also to the panelists, which Christy and I will sort of leverage through and speak to the different panelists that we have. And with this, I would like to actually hand over to the pan panelists and ask them to introduce themselves so that we can kick off this engaging conversation. So maybe Jeremy, if I could ask you to go first. Thanks, Roshni, and thanks so much for the opportunity of talking uh, about this important subject today. Uh, my name is Jeremy Cohen. I'm a partner at a uh, agency called Blurred. Blurred is a strategic and creative um, advisory firm uh, specialised in what we call ESGP, so putting together the purpose with the ESG strategy. And we're called Blurred because what we see around the world is that blurring of uh, communications and operational strategy, uh, the blurring of stakeholders and the blurring of issues. Everywhere we look, we see this, this blurring. And actually, Blurred is a, a combination of both management consultancy and agencies. I've spent my career in sustainability and uh, increasingly in ESG um, with companies like Philips, Shell, um, Arcadis, but also on the agency side with agencies like Edelman, uh, Salter Baxter, and now Blurred. And um, coming to this point uh, very happily have felt this tipping point where ESG has really become a, a critically important topic. So glad to be here today. Thank you, Jeremy. Kate, could I ask you to go next? Thanks, Roshni. Hi, my name is Kate Chapman, and I'm a freelance sustainability consultant. Uh, like Jeremy, I've kind of yeah, spent um, pretty much the last uh, 20 years, probably a bit more than that, actually working within the area of, of sustainability. It's morphed from sort of corporate social responsibility in the early days and, and then through um, sort of uh, yeah, environmental sustainability. And then in 2015, B Corp arrived in the UK and, uh, and I got involved pretty much straight away with, with the B Corp uh, movement in the UK, because as we will go on to, to talk in more detail, it really brings together all these different strands of, of what sustainable business is all about. So uh, I spend probably 60 to 70% of my time now working with companies, helping them to either achieve the B Corp certification or to progress beyond that. Uh, once they've got their B Corp certification, it's, it's not an end, um, it's a point on a, on a journey, if you like. Uh, and the rest of my time is, is spent working with organizations uh, developing sustainability strategies for them because B Corp isn't the only certification in town and you don't necessarily have to have a certification. But as, as Jeremy said, this whole area of ESG sustainability is becoming increasingly important. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of interest in it. Glad to be here today as well. Thank you, Kate. Hugh, over to you. Thanks, Rashni. Um, hello, everyone. So I'm Hugh Lewis. I'm head of proposition strategy at Gusto. Gusto is one of the UK's biggest uh, recipe box companies, um, selling 53 million meals in, in 2020. We're also a recently certified B Corp uh, back in August this year. Um, and my and my team's focus is on how we can improve Gusto's product for our customers. Uh, and a big part of that is 
in heading up our sustainability team, understanding our areas of biggest impact, setting strategy targets, engaging the business, um, better incorporating sustainability in our day-to-day decision-making. Um, and I won't talk uh, about my thoughts and experience of B Corp in detail here because we'll cover this a little bit later, but very briefly, we initially got signed off uh, to go for B Corp uh, at the end of 2019 and ran a very intensive process from later in 2020 because of the disruption of the pandemic earlier that year uh, to click submit about this time last year uh, to then go through the the audit process. So looking forward to talking about that and some other topics a little bit later. Thank you, Hugh, and congratulations again on your BCOP certification. Perfect. Now, just jumping into the main question, Jeremy, I'll pick up what you started the conversation with, which was about you're seeing a blurring between ESG and purpose, et cetera. And I really like that concept. So the question that we've often heard is, what is ESG versus purpose? A lot of times businesses tend to think about it as one of the same, but actually these can be two distinctive things. And why is it actually important to communicate your ESG and purpose in slightly synergistic but distinct manners? Uh, so, yeah, I think you're right. They are two different things, but they need to be tackled together. And um, in our view, you can't have the one without the other. Um, what I think is that where actually a lot of companies go wrong is thinking about their ESG strategy as their, let's say, their sustainability investor play and purpose as their communications and marketing. And that's really the wrong way of thinking about it. Um, the reality is that both ESG and purpose are required to be tackled together. Uh, underneath that operational strategy if you are going to deliver stakeholder impact. I think there are plenty of companies out there that get this right, but too many of them have become almost cliches in this space. So everyone ends up talking about Patagonia and talk about uh, Unilever. Um, What we need is to be thinking about companies that are tackling these things together, there being being the norm rather than the exception. I think one that uh, I would point to is doing them slightly separated is Tesla. So Tesla has the mission to advance the transition to sustainable mobility. That's, you know, they don't use the term, but basically that's their purpose. But of course, when you think about Tesla from the ESG point of view, whilst the, the whilst delivering on that mission means that they're doing lots of good things across ESG, they're not tackling it as an ESG strategy. And actually, if you look at the S and to a certain extent the G as well, there are many things that Tesla are doing where you'd say actually they're falling pretty short. Um, I think a company that is doing more on the ESG side and uh, hasn't yet uh, tied that so much to the purpose as a company we work with called Arshlik. So Arshlik is a Turkish multinational, um, one of the world's leading white goods uh, manufacturers and distributors with brands like uh, Beko and uh, Grindic. And um, the work that I've seen come out of Arshlik, where they first made sure that they become a carbon neutral company through offset, lots of issues around offset, but first of all, they said offset, they set a clear path path towards carbon neutral um, operationally. They've set scope three pathway for the next 10 years with clear um, uh, ton by ton targets for the next 10 years for scope three emissions. And they started to look across their their partner supply chain uh, uh, and and every other part of the, the, the organization. They're looking at the customer as a partner in this and very much as a partner, uh, part of the solution and a visionary CEO who's operating um, globally from a very complex home market being in Turkey. So I think that's a, an example of a company that's doing the ESG part well and has not become obsessed about the purpose part, and that's, that's maybe the next part of the journey. Tesla is an example of a company that's doing their mission and their purpose very well, but has not thought about it so much from an ESG point of view. And then just to kind of conclude my, my kind of response to this question, Um, come back to where I started. So I've been in and around this space for over 20 years. And like I say, we've become, we've arrived at that tipping point where um, when uh, organizations look at ESG and purpose through a risk and opportunity lens, they start to think about how do they make impact through the business and that that becomes a prerequisite for being a well-managed business. That's the tipping point we're at, where where investors and other stakeholders are saying, if you want to be seen as a well-managed business, yes, we want to lay out your purpose that's super important but it needs to be tied together to how you're delivering that operationally and most organizations are now saying the ESG framework helps them do that. Perfect thank you Jeremy I think that's really interesting to see the two examples and I think when it comes to ESG specifically 
one of the questions that is coming up is where do you start? And that's where materiality becomes a really core concept, right? Financially material risks and opportunities and also thinking about your stakeholders when building your ESG narrative because you're ultimately trying to target them. Um, so how can a business sort of start thinking about this financial materiality and stakeholders, especially when it comes to their narrative side? Uh, well, I actually would look at both the ESG and the P side uh, through the same prism, which is risk and opportunity. So 85% of investors are now looking or considering ESG as a key criteria in their investment decision. So think about it in terms of risk management in the same way that 30 years ago, they would have looked at a, uh, an organization that was polluting a lot, that's a risk, or an organization that's losing top management on a frequent basis, that's a risk. So thinking about it from the financial perspective, which is about risk and opportunity, I think is the right place to start. When you bring it to the narrative, it's about being clear about the impact that you're looking to create with clear targets and where possible a clear time horizon to, to deliver those targets. Um, what we do in with all our work is apply that lens of materiality. So um, material, materiality impact assessment, we use SASB or GRI, very, very often we use SASB. Um, but understanding the material aspects of the business for different stakeholders and how to manage those risks, that's, that's absolutely the place to start. I think what ties to that then is reporting. So you start, you've got materiality, you start to understand what your impact is, then you need to report on it. And again, reporting needs to be done in a very um, conscientious, conscientious manner, manner, right? So uh, reporting that's regular, that's transparent, that's consistent and developed against well-established reporting principles. Um, and of course, we're seeing now a lot of pressure on the ESG community to say reporting and standards need to be consolidated and, and absolutely need to meet those, those criteria. So that, that's complicated, but I think it's a good thing. Um, when it comes to the narrative itself, it's about being credible and about being authentic. And, and one of the things which I think a lot of companies um, are either afraid to, to do um, or but I don't, let's not talk about why, but one of the things they don't do on a standard basis is test the narrative with their employees. Mm -hmm. And that is actually, you've got that community of people that work for you who will be able to look at that and say, we recognize ourselves and our organization in these statements, in this, in this way that we want to articulate um, uh, what our, our ESG and, and uh, purpose uh, journey is going to be. So that's an incredibly important stakeholder group, which too often I think is left behind, left behind. and they will tell you if it's credible and authentic um, because they will know the organisation they're, they're working for. Last thing to say on that, this is communicate impact over ambition. Um, so a lot of organisations expect to get the credit for communicating an ambition and that's the wrong way of looking at it. You've got to start to deliver impact and then say where that's going to take you. You won't get the credit just for delivering the, uh, or for communicating the, the ambition, especially in these days. And I think the last thing is to say it should be core to the business. I see companies sometimes say, okay, social justice is a very important issue. So we're going to orientate everything we do over the next 12 months around social justice. It's a very important topic and absolutely companies should have a point of view. But the, the main thrust of what you do when you're talking about creating impact through the ESG strategy should be linked to your core business. So the further away it gets from what you actually do day to day, I think the more uh, tenuous that, that becomes. Very final thing to say, uh, and back to this point about using the employees, is think about establishing an external advisory board because you've got incredible people out there, most of whom would be willing to come and hear what you're doing and critique it um, positively, or, or, or let's say constructively critique it. Um, most of those people will do that without necessarily needing to be paid. Very often I work with advisory groups that we put together and we, we make charitable charitable contributions on their, on their behalf. But those people are gonna look at that narrative and say, this, this is where it works and this is where it's problematic and we want to understand what you've got behind that. That's an incredible tool. And I think when we fall into that trap of thinking about this as marketing or communications, it becomes very easy to say, we'd rather not hear those uh, critical outside voices. It's an incredibly important thing to do. So, so develop the narrative in all those ways, but make sure you've got the people that uh, can challenge it and, uh, and push you further. Perfect. Thank you, Jeremy. Some very really interesting points. And maybe, Kate, I'll shift over to you because one of the points that Jeremy raised about is that there's this need in the market to have common ground on what ESG communication, reporting, et cetera, should be. And B Corp, to some extent, is filling that gap. But B Corp is much more because it also incorporates purpose within it. 
So as a B Corp expert, maybe could you could you start us off by just thinking about what is B Corp certification practically and what does it mean for a business to get B Corp certified? Yeah, sure. So um, I suppose there's... Uh, to start out with, I'll say that the, 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 the B Corp um, certification is, is one path you could take. And, and, and the route to, to get there is, um, in practical terms, is, is completing an online tool called the B Impact Assessment. Uh, and that's a kind of really holistic assessment of all the positive social, uh, environmental and to a certain extent economic impacts that, that a company has. Um, it's a free tool and it doesn't have to lead to certification. So I've worked with lots of companies who use it as a, as a benchmarking tool. So you can go in and you can fill it in and, um, and that's completely private to you until you press the, the submit button and there are lots of things you need to do. You can't accidentally submit it. Uh, so it's a, it's a really useful tool just to get a, an idea of, well, you know, we, we think we're doing all these really great things actually, how do we stack up? And you can benchmark yourselves against other companies of your size in the UK or in Europe or globally. You can benchmark against others in your industry. I mean, you can filter it a number of different ways to see how you stack up. But the impact assessment covers five areas, um, which is what makes it so much more comprehensive than a lot of the other standards that are out there. So it looks at governance to start with, um, and particularly around things like you know, codes of ethics, your board composition, your transparency, um, how much kind of social and environmental decision making is built into some of the, the processes and, and practices within your organization. Then it looks at workers. And as you would imagine, it's that's kind of, you know, well, how do you treat your staff and everything from um, pay and benefits to training um, to sort of health and wellness initiatives health and safety that kind of thing it covers community uh, and that includes diversity and inclusion that includes supply chain that includes economic contribution and also things like philanthropy staff volunteering it looks at environment um, the full range of energy, waste, water, carbon emissions, transport, packaging, if that's relevant to you, input materials, if that's relevant to you. Uh, and then it looks at customers and how you, and, and that covers quality, um, uh, customer satisfaction, customer feedback, data protection, and that kind of thing. And the, the questions that you get asked completely depend on the type of company you are, what market you operate in, what size of company you are, what industry sector you're in. It gets quite granular so that um, it's it's unusual for two companies to be answering exactly the same set of questions. And the points that you score on those questions are weighted and allocated depending on the what they call the track that you're on. So for a, a, a manufacturing company, the points will be more heavily weighted to things like supply chain and environment. And for a service-led company or a service-based company, the points are more heavily weighted towards um, customers, workers and governance, for example, because there's less of an environmental impact if you're mainly office based, don't have a supply chain, don't have distribution, don't have manufacturing. So it's quite a comprehensive impact assessment. Uh, there's a lot of information needed to kind of fill it in and, and, and get an accurate picture of where you are. And you need to reach a score of 80 points on that. And it's not 80 out of anything because theoretic, well, there probably is a maximum amount you could score, but um, it's tough to get over 80, put it that way. Some of the, the highest scoring B Corps out there are up in the kind of maybe 115, 120, but they're yes. really, really high scoring. Mostly companies are scrabbling to get to that 80 or, or, or just over point. Um, you need to also change your articles of association or your partnership agreement if you're a partnership. Uh, and, and there's some legal wording that goes in there, which effectively enshrines in your objects um, that you uh, commit to having a positive social and environmental impact and that you commit to considering the needs of all your stakeholders and not just your shareholders. Um, so it doesn't mean you have to consider all your stakeholders equally, but it removes the requirement that is there certainly in UK law and, uh, and I think in US law that, you know, shareholders have to come first, um, yep. which can, can kind of skew decision making. Um, and, you know, in practical terms, how that helps and, and for, for companies that have become B Corp, they find it's it's hugely helpful in terms of raising investment 
because it's this sort of external validation of all the good stuff they're doing. So a good chunk of sort of due diligence on that ESG front has been done if, if by, by B Lab if you become a B Corp. Really helps with recruitment. Um, I've got some clients. I've got a number of clients down in Cornwall who, who have struggled to attract in the past to attract people to move to Cornwall um, to come and work for them. And since becoming B Corp, they found that that problem has gone away. People really want to work for B Corps. It sends a really, really strong signal about the, the ethos of the company and the, 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 the yeah, that they're just a, a, a good place to work for. Um, and then it's that sort of differentiation in the market. Again, it depends on the sector that you're in, but um, that, that B Corp mark is becoming increasingly well known uh, by the public. So it, it can provide that sort of point of differentiation. Um, and it takes, I mean, in practical terms, it, it's a good few months. I mean, Hugh, I think, and we'll talk about it more, you know, it can take a year. That's not unusual um, for, for smaller companies, maybe with less complex uh, supply chains, for example. I mean, it, you, it'd be good going if you got through it in, in seven, eight months. Um, so it's, it's quite a process. Thank you. Okay. So it's a huge opportunity certain risks as well that businesses should be aware of when going down this B Corp certification process. Could you maybe share a little bit about the risk side of this? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, without wanting to come, come over as too negative, um, I suppose the opportunities, I would say, first of all, are greater than the risks. Uh, but there is a commitment, certainly, in terms of time and resource. Uh, it, as I said, it's it's a it's quite a process. It's it's a good few months um, usually to get through it. So it's it's whether you've got the the bandwidth internally to commit people to that uh, and to commit to making the changes that that might be needed to reach the B Corp standard. Um, there is a cost involved, and that's dependent on your revenue. So it's a tiered uh, a tiered cost model. It's an, a, an annual cost, uh, and then reputationally you've got to be I guess you you need to be, there are lots of questions asked of you there's a dis, uh, a disclosure questionnaire at the end where there will be lots of questions asked as to whether you've got anything that you need to um, sort of fess up to whether that's late payment of, of tax or whether you've got um, any employees who've taken you to tribunals whether you've had product recalls whether you've had trading standards issues but it, also whether you you um, whether you're involved in the sale or trade of animal products, for example. So, I mean, I'm sure that Hugh would have been asked for that with Gusto. That's not uncommon, whether you're involved in the sale of bottled water. It's really, really comprehensive because they want to know whether there's anything that could come back and sort of damage you reputationally. Uh, and, and people may have seen in the press that Brewdog, for example, became a, a, a B Corp earlier this year to great fanfare. Uh, and then uh, sort of slightly come back to bite them because not long after they became a B Corp, um, 250 or so of their former employees wrote an open letter uh, uh, talking about the toxic culture that, ex that exists and questioning some of the claims that were made by the company around their sort of sustainability and ESG strategy. Uh, and that sort of thrown their, their B Corp certification up in the air and, and they're being investigated at the moment. So there's a risk if you are not completely transparent. Mm. Uh, and if, if there's anything that you think you ought to let them know that then yeah, let them know because ultimately it's, it's likely to come out. I guess the more you go out and shout about your credentials and what you're doing, and I'm sure Jeremy will, will, will have had some experience of this as well and, and have some things to say about this. You've really got to be sure that you've got your house in order. Absolutely. The reputation piece is the biggest, I think, concern that I also think of that if you're committing to it, you need to follow through for the years to come. It, it can't just be a one year thing and you're done with it. Um, and maybe with this huge, just asking you to jump in because Gusto went through the whole week of process, you must have thought about the opportunities and risks. So essentially, what was the motivation for, for Gusto specifically to think about, okay, B Corp is the right certification for us? And also, how has this now been part of your performance and growth journey? Like, are there certain things that you're seeing come up as part of becoming B Corp certified? Sure. So, um, 
Gusto's purpose has always been to, to have a positive impact on, on people and the planet. And it's even intrinsic to our business model in the sense that um, we shorten supply chains. We also reduce food waste in the home from about 17% in the UK to almost zero because we send pre-portioned ingredients to our customers. Um, so the B Corp is something that really resonated with us um, already and becoming certified um, holds us accountable, I suppose, to this commitment to growing in the right way for people and, and the planet. And in addition to that, building on some of the points that Kate made, um, and B Corp is a, a very well respected, uh, comprehensive, independent framework um, that I think has the momentum to become even more of a leading certification in, in this area. So I think when we first looked at it uh, a couple of years ago, there were just 2,750 B Corps. And I think now there are over 4,000. So you can see the rate of rate of growth just in two short years. Um, now with, with the alignment uh, between our purpose and the goal of B Corp, um, uh, it hasn't necessarily meant that we've changed our approach to business, um, but we have experienced uh, some benefits that were part of our original motivation for, for choosing to start out, out on the B Corp certification journey and um, contributed to the really strong support we have from the leadership team and, and the board. Uh, so the first of those was going through the B Impact assessment that Kate mentioned, um, which is the very comprehensive questionnaire that you have to work through. Uh, has been really helpful for prioritizing what we do in the area of sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also uh, a hugely positive commitment in terms of employee engagement and attracting new talent. Uh, and that's particularly relevant for us given the pace at which we're hiring. So we, we doubled our workforce in 2020. We're on track to double again this year to 2000 people. Um, customers are also becoming more aware of what B Corp is. Um, so it's a very uh, positive move for attracting new customers and, and retaining those um, customers. There's also a bit of a snowball effect with our suppliers. So since we have started proactively going after B Corp, um, one has recently become certified themselves and there are lots who are starting out on that process, completing the B Impact assessment, assessment and uh, beginning to make some changes. Um, and then uh, from the investment side of things, investors are also looking for companies that have this kind of certification. Um, so Danone, I happen to know, has a 2 billion euro loan from a syndicate of mainstream bankers, which has a lower interest rate predicated on Danone maintaining its B Corp status. So it goes to show the importance that investors are, are putting on this area. As for growth, um, we've been growing really strongly over the last five years. And our five-year compound annual growth rate is uh, to Canada year uh, 2020 um, is around 100%. Growth is fantastic, obviously, but it wasn't the key motivation for us becoming certified. Um, for us, it's all about growing responsibility in the right way for, for people and the planet. That said, we know that there are direct correlations between our progress in sustainability and business growth. So we know that our customers care about sustainability and will choose a product or a brand that is more sustainable over one that is less. We also know that um, customers retain better if they see, for example, less plastic in their gusto box. And mm -hmm. this is an area that we've been able to make great progress in. So cutting plastic in our boxes by 50% last year and uh, switching to more sustainable packaging and launching something called the Eco Chill Box, which is our insulator that keeps things fresh um, out of recycled cardboard. And um, so even if uh, we have only recently certified in, in uh, July, August time, um, we have seen a clear link between sustainability and growth. And I'm, I'm sure that B Corp certification will contribute further to that into the, into the future. Thank you, Hugh. And at the board level, has this brought a further clarity on conversations? Because there are those five areas. So are you able to like, is it now easier to focus and have that conversation with the senior leadership? Yeah, so we, we have a sustainability strategy with six different focus areas um, and it has encouraged us to have conversations about where we're investing above and beyond other areas. Um, 
which areas are most material to us as a business. One of the other things that B Corp certification means is that you have to, as a business, create something called an impact report, which is shared with your board. Um, so again, that helps to raise this area in terms of its prominence with, uh, with the board, with the senior leadership team, and that can only be a positive thing in terms of momentum. Yeah, perfect. And I know you would have led this process internally, uh, the B Corp one. So what was sort of unexpected about it, maybe the positive and the negative as you went through the whole process? Yeah, so speaking speaking honestly, uh, I mean, it took a lot longer than expected. Um, the, the time horizon that, that Kate mentioned is, is, I think, probably quite normal. Um, it was partly in our case due to the pandemic um, and therefore not being able to run a project related to certification in the way that we wanted. But it's also because the demand for B Corp, which has exploded recently, has meant that um, the audit process currently takes a little longer than previously. And it's mm -hmm. something that I know that B, B Lab, the organization that runs B Corp is working on. Um, not unexpected, but um, it is an incredibly thorough process. So we had to validate about 100 or 30% of the questions we answered with submitted evidence uh, with the auditor. And um, they are very friendly, the auditors. Um, it's not necessarily an intimidating audit process itself, but they are very diligent, which gives you, I guess, more, more confidence in the certification itself. And it's worth saying that there are some more technical aspects uh, to the certification. So for instance, there's something called impact business models, where if you qualify as a business with an impact business model, you have slightly different questions and a slightly different weighting to the answers, which we didn't know at the outset. Um, but one um, uh, of the very, I suppose, encouraging and heartwarming um, aspects of the process was the strength and the um, the strength of the B Corp community and people's willingness to help. So along the way, we had advice from companies who had recently gone through the process. We had some free coaching from B Lab. Uh, Ryan Cohn, um, who's the co one of the co-founders of Propercorn, which is also a B Corp, spoke to us and answered all of our questions, which was fantastic for engaging people around the business. So it really was a case, not just of us being a single business, um, going for certification, it was a case of people rallying, rallying around and helping out if they could. Uh, so that was um, a really positive experience for us. That's really good to know. Um, I've heard a lot about the B Corp community. I think the conversation and ability to just listen and talk to each other really does resonate quite well with a lot of companies. Um, and looking at Gusto's sort of ambition beyond B Corp, I guess there is the wider idea that communicating your purpose and your ESG is going to be a differentiator for you, as you said, for your employees and your customers. So what else is critical for you all or what essentially is critical beyond B Corp or inclusive of B Corp when it comes to messaging internally and externally? So, I mean, staying on the topics of certifications just for a moment, I mean, we will always look at certification in areas that are material to us as a business. So, for instance, in our supply chain, we use ZX. Um, we'll be exploring options like SAI certification for our suppliers. But for, for comms, what we find um, is effective and, and works well for us is um, working with expert third parties um, to make sure that we are saying something which is credible uh, when communicating to our audiences. So for example, we work with um, an environmental agency, Food Steps, um, to conduct research into our carbon footprint and um, conduct uh, a comparative LCA analysis that found that Gusto Dinners produce um, 30, uh, sorry, 23% less carbon emissions than the equivalent supermarket shop. When we have something like that, we then try to put that impact into context with relatable comparisons so okay. uh, that it means something and resonates with consumers. So, for instance, we can say each Gusto order saves two kilos of food waste, uh, meaning that in 2020, the UK saved X number of uh, hundreds of thousands of waste bins of waste by ordering through um, Gusto or in 2020, Gusto saved 40,000 um, tons of CO2 equivalent, which is the equivalent to taking off almost uh, 5,000 cars off the road. Um, so it's helping our customers to see the positive impact that they're having by shopping with us. Um, and it's important that it, it doesn't 
look like we are just showing off about our success, but really proving the impact that our customers can have themselves. Um, that's been most effective. Interesting. So you're saying being credible about what you're responding to externally and then making it relatable to the customer themselves so that they can actually understand what does this mean? Absolutely. Um, yeah, perfect. Um, from that, maybe turning over to you, Kate and Jeremy, is that, of course, you both have said that B Corp is one aspect that companies can focus on, but there are a number of certifications that we see outside that could be very useful to avoid greenwashing or impact washing. Um, so maybe, Jeremy, starting with you, what other certifications, accreditations, or communications perhaps companies could take that are outside of B Corp? Well, I think it's one of the reasons why ESG investing is getting a little bit of a hard time at the moment is because there's just so much out there that everyone's clamoring over each other to claim, look at us, we're great, we got this. And yeah. I think that's, that's one of the things we advise all of our clients to, to not do is when they become certified is the certification is not the moment necessarily to make a, a big song and dance about it. We've gone through this process and we've got the, the certification. Um, it's not, it shouldn't be seen as a communications moment. I think one of the things which is really important about B Corp, and, and I fail to say throughout this conversation that Plurd is also a certified B Corp organization. We're very proud of that. And so we do think, believe it. So it's a really good standard. Um, I think one of the things which is really great about it is that it forces an organization to go through a journey where they have to start applying that lens, what we call the lens of ASGP, to everything they do as a business. And that's what you really want to achieve. If you want the organization to be thinking in terms of how do we create, uh, how, how do we think about every decision we take through that lens. Um, come back to your question, though, the part of the problem is there's just so much stuff out there. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's about choosing the gold standard for whatever topic is that you're, you're trying to uh, create impact in. I think when it comes to climate change, the Science Based Targets Initiative is clearly right now, the, the absolute standard that uh, organizations should be um, submitting their pathway uh, targets into and getting that uh, quality assurance there. I think uh, we see regulation now coming from the EU, which is gonna be applied in the UK as well with EU taxonomy, that's gonna have a significant impact. Um, we see that standards are starting to converge uh, a decade ago, well over a decade ago, I, work, I was working with the IIRC on integrated reporting and how they brought that together with GRI, effectively never really took off. But now because of the amount of investment, the amount of money which is um, being invested in ESG, there's a real push now to make sure that we are seeing um, convergence when it comes to uh, reporting standards and, uh, and other areas as well. So I think that's important. But come back to, to where I start talking about the certification part. So certification is important, but ultimately within this space right now, a lot of the certif certification that you're working to is going to be a dance. And I don't mean that when it comes to B Corp, but there are certain certificates that you can apply for out there where it's give me a little bit of this and then you get a bit mm -hmm. of feedback and then you resubmit. And I've worked with organizations where I've seen the dance that goes on to get to certification at the end. And that's a problem. Um, because ultimately, regulation will it will force everyone to meet the same standards. Whereas I think too many uh, certifications out there right now mm. allow wiggle room here and there in order to get people across a line. Mm. And even with SBTI in the past, not right now, but in the past, the part of the push of SBTI was how do we make sure that companies are actually getting towards two degrees? That's part of the motivation. Whereas now it has to be, how do we ensure that they're actually delivering one and a half degrees? So there's a, there's a movement there as well. So I, this whole space is, is complex. It's confusing. It's some parts of it are pretty shady. Um, getting towards regulation and, and common stance, I think it's going to be an important next step. Thank you, Jeremy. Kate, your, your sort of reflection on, you know, regulatory, we've heard a lot about ISO certifications also coming through and supply chains having their own certifications. So what's your take on what outside of B Corp can be undertaken credibly for businesses to show, demonstrate this aspect? You're on mute, Kate. Um, a lot of it depends on, um, on, on what the business wants to achieve and, and what they want to show. So I think, I mean, it's possible, certainly possible to have more than one certification uh, and and some of them work really really well together. So, um, you know, absolutely, you know, B Corp can sit alongside a uh, science based targets initiative, 
Uh, it can sit alongside Planet Mark, which is another one that that is is all about um, particularly kind of understanding and measuring your your um, your carbon footprint and then all your all your greenhouse gases and then uh, engaging your stakeholders around that and then communicating it. So there are there are some very specific certifications depending on the business you're in and if you're if you're in clothing you might want to be part of the better cotton initiative and if you're in tea and coffee you might want to be rainforest alliance you might want to be fair trade there are there are some sector specific certifications that might be helpful for you in terms of avoiding greenwash um more broadly i would say that and, and we'll possibly come on to talk about this more but collecting data measuring and collecting data for me would be that that's got to be your starting point you, you you need to understand what your impacts are i think as jeremy mentioned earlier you've really got to understand what's going on and then you and what's material to you so i mean if you're if you're a big manufacturer and i don't know you're kind of um but you don't use any water in your in your process but you're busy measuring the water that you're using to flush the toilets and make your teas and coffees that's not material you should be measuring your energy use for example so Focus on what those impacts are that you're having. Start collecting data, start measuring, because only then can you credibly tell a story about what you're doing. And only then can you measure what, what difference it makes when you when you try things, when you implement actions to, to try and uh, minimise those impacts. You've got to be able to measure that. And then, uh, yeah, I would just be really, really careful about going out there and making any claims. As, as Jeremy said, there are lots of ways you can go out and say, I'm carbon positive I'm carbon negative I'm climate neutral I'm climate positive I'm climate negative many of these things all sort of <laughs> mean the same thing but 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 they don't really and it depends how you've achieved that and if you've just gone and bought offsets but it's business as usual then to me that isn't credible that's greenwashing so I would always advise be really cautious you've got to get your own house in order first before you go out and start sort of shouting about what you're doing with your supply chain um so yeah tread carefully and and yeah, um, if, if it's easy to get a certification, then possibly it's 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 not as credible. Mm, possibly it depends. If you're really good, if you've got everything in place, fine. Yeah. But so yeah. interesting. So you're saying that there's an industry re, industry dependent certification that you should first look at. Like, is, is it useful for you? How hard or difficult it is to achieve those industry specific certifications because they would be looking at your material impacts. And then when it specifically comes to greenwashing, which relates to the focus on climate change, you really need the data to be able to demonstrate it, as well as the strategy side of it, to be able to say that you're doing this in a credible manner and not just buying offsets, correct? Yeah, although, I mean, greenwashing doesn't have to just apply to, to climate change. It can apply to any aspect of, of claiming environmental credentials for a pro product um, that doesn't have them. Um, I was on a call recently with someone who was sort of claiming that, that that their glass products were biodegradable because well glass is made of sand isn't it uh and so you know that there's lots of room for misinterpretation or or yeah so so I think it's yeah it's it's um it's just important like I say to kind of have that data and, and not be going out there and making bold claims when you haven't got data and evidence to back that up yeah no, perfect, James. And then, Jeremy, maybe like staying on this for a second, um, you know, as as we've seen in Gusto, Gusto, Gusto's quite thoughtful, like they're thinking about we don't want to make a claim where we don't have the data and we don't have a strategy. Uh, but there are companies out there intentionally or unintentionally who may go out and make some claims on their ESG strategy or the narrative, which is just bad communication. That should not be happening. So, how do companies sort of stay clear of it? Are there some warning signals that they should be looking out for when they're going out and thinking, okay, this is what we're going to be claiming or communicating? Uh, yeah, so you're absolutely right. And I think one of the tricks here is, uh, tricks, one of the, the important things here is to make sure that your communications and marketing teams are partners on that journey with the sustainability with your sustainability team or other parts of the organization. I think I, I come from the communications industry, started my career as a journalist before moving into comms, before moving into sustainability. And being able to understand all different parts of the end of the organization and that journey is really important because it means that the communications people should be savvy enough to be able to look at a claim and say, well, we're not going to make that stand up um, mm -hmm. for certain groups of stakeholders. And I think that there is a there's currently a 
shortage of relevant expertise within the communications and the marketing functions to really understand what the ESG and the operational strategy of an organization is. So I think that's part of it. Related to that, um, and I just want to emphasize something that Kate just said, you know, be very careful throwing around labels and slogans. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to go all Greta Thunberg on everyone here and start talking about blah, blah, blah. But it's true that there is so much nonsense spoken in this space and people hear a, a, a slogan or a label and then they just start throwing it out there without really understanding what it means and, and what they're actually effectively communicating about what their organization is doing. So make sure you can truly stand behind what it is that you want to say because you will be caught out. And that's the sort of really key thing. 20 years ago, you could totally get away with it. Uh, um, I, I was at Shell during the, the years of uh, BP and Beyond Petroleum. Um, mm -hmm. you, could, you could get away with it until something like the Gulf of Mexico happened. Today, you can't. Today, you start throwing out greenwashing. Uh, you start greenwashing and you'll get caught very quickly. A um, couple of, uh, I think, relevant examples to that. So, uh, and this is without me actually causing ex any kind of aspersions on the companies because there's ongoing issues. But Oatly, Swedish um, mm -hmm. oat milk manufacturer, they went public in New York earlier this year in a $12.5 billion IPO. They've now got a major lawsuit um, brought by one of the significant investors in that IPO, calling them out for greenwashing, not, not just greenwashing, also some accounting regularities, irregularities, but specifically saying there was greenwashing in the prospectus, that the organization had been cherry picking stats that made it look good, ignoring other issues like water consumption, which were potentially problematic, not talking about the impact of international expansion and not talking about um, related issues like uh, wastewater. So this specific investor that, that participated in that IPO is now saying that uh, they believe that the company is 70% overvalued based on the claims they made in the prospectus. Okay, let's not talk about their due diligence, but, uh, but uh, I think it's a good example of where things can go wrong. Yeah. And then, um, you know, the, the, back to my point before about how the regulators are starting to scrutinise this area much more closely now. Um, Allbirds, the uh, shoe manufacturer in the US, which is a great company, by the way, I've, I've had their products and I think they're amazing. Mm -hmm. But when they were preparing for their IPO, they first started talking about it as the first sustainable IPO. Mm -hmm. um, they then got a, a backlash from the SEC on that. And uh, they've now gone from saying, that it would be a sustainable IPO to being a sustainable uh, stable offering, then saying that they would apply sustainability principles and objectives mm -hmm. in a framework. So every single time kind of watering it down, watering it down. And of course, they're saying that this is because of the pressure from the SEC. But I think it just demonstrates, you know, these throwing around, around these slogans, um, trying to get on the ESG investing bandwagon. It can be very dangerous because people, once you start making those claims, people are going to really scrut start scrutinizing your business very carefully. Um, for me, it's another reason for having the external counsel, I'm not talking about blurred, but having those external advisory groups who will at worst be critical friends, mm -hmm. but at best they can be credible ambassadors for what you're setting out to do. Interesting. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Very interesting on Oatly. Oh, that's actually scary. Um, and, and with this, actually, we have a couple of questions that I will, from the audience that I would also bring in at this point of time, uh, maybe starting with you, Hugh, and this is a question to everybody, but like on your perspective, like what is your view about the importance of carbon offsetting? So how is Gusto thinking about carbon offsetting versus the other initiatives that you can take in terms of emission reduction? Um, so uh, one of our six areas in our sustainability strategy is about acting on climate change. Um, and uh, we are in the process of setting decarbonization targets um, at the moment. I think um, it's fair to say that our focus um, has to be on decarbonization or making the cuts. Those are avoided emissions um, and are permanent. Um, and uh, Jeremy mentioned there are lots of issues with offset and that is, that is true. Um, I don't think they should be used as a way for a, a business to ex excuse effectively its emissions. Often they aren't permanent. It's not a regulated market. So there are very much good offsets and bad offsets. Um, so they have to be used in the right way. And um, as a business, we will be focusing on decarbonization in the short term, mm -hmm. well, short to long term, and maybe using some offsets uh, tactically if we are uh, confident about their um, quality 
which isn't necessarily the case even with some of the certifications out there so um yeah so, but we're treading carefully <laughs> so very carefully on that yeah maybe to you Kate and Jeremy on uh, when is an offset legitimate let's say that like when would you think about that this this business actually really thought about you know carbon decarbonization and now this offsetting is the right way for them to go when would that point come um, well, from my perspective, yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a sort of a hierarchy, and and offset should be the the, the last resort. So it should be once you have done your utmost to to decarbonize, uh, and when you you end up with the sort of residual emissions, that there's just there's nothing you can do about them at that point. And it's it's going to it's they're a they are a probably a useful tool while we all figure out how to decarbonize because for for many of the emissions maybe the infrastructure just isn't there yet or the technology isn't quite there yet to be able to get rid of absolutely everything i mean distribution is a huge issue right i mean at the moment particularly if you're importing anything moving stuff around whether by ship whether by road whether by rail whether by um whether by air there are emissions associated with that mm -hmm. and so it, it's it's very difficult to to completely decarbonize mm -hmm. um so when you've done the the maximum that you can do as a business then those residual emissions then yeah there is a place for offsets but as you said there are there are good and bad mm -hmm. um it is becoming increasingly oh, regulated there are there are standards out there um uh, that that you can measure your offsets against, or, or you can go and buy them from from accredited offset providers. But again, you need to do your due diligence into uh, who the best offset providers are. Mm. There are some offset providers who are themselves B Corp, so that some due diligence has already been done there for you. Mm. Um, but you know there are there are lots of good offset providers, um, but equally there are a lot of um, yeah more dubious ones out there. So I think there is there is a place for it, but it isn't the answer, and it certainly should never be used as an excuse to carry on business as usual, calculate how much carbon you're you're emitting from your business activities, and just pay your way out of it. That that is entirely wrong. Yeah, understood. So Jeremy, maybe getting your views on this, and specifically on how your client conversations go on good versus bad offsets, because I'm sure that comes up as well. So again, I agree a lot with what, what Kate just said. I think it is a last resort. Um, I think the other thing about it is that uh, we would tell clients, you're only going to start talking about offsetting as a short-term solution if you've got the long-term pathway. And that word's really important because we've heard around COP and, and since so many organizations and governments out there talking about net zero as mm -hmm. just kind of, well, we'll get to it in 2030, we'll get to it in 2040, we'll get to it in 2050. But without having a pathway of how you get there, that's just, I'm promising you something down the line. So yeah. what we say to clients, and I mentioned the example of Ashwin before, is if they, if they want to use offsetting today because it fulfills an immediate need to offset residual emissions, it's okay if you can accompany it with your pathway of how you want to achieve operational net zero in the future, preferably around scope one, two, and three emissions. So not just one and two. Um, so that's that, those are the kind of conversations we have. But our starting point is, Offsets are not the answer. Um, let's talk about everything else and then we'll come back to it right at the end. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, Kit, there's a question that came for you about uh, B Corp and, and the observation that there aren't as many B Corps when it comes to sort of the high intensity sectors like manufacturing equipment, building materials. Why is that the case and what can be done in order to assist organizations to participate to become B Corp? Yeah, um, and I've, I've sort of I put a few a few thoughts down in the chat there. I mean, I think um, off the top of my head, I, I imagine that for those companies, because they're not directly customer facing, or they're not out there, and you know, they're not selling to the to the general public, they're B two B rather than B two C. I think there's there's less of that um, pull factor that actually having the B Corp certification would help differentiate us in the marketplace and help us to stand out. Um, I also think that for manufacturing companies, so from my experience of working with manufacturers, it is more difficult. I mean, this is a sweeping statement, but it is more difficult mm. for them to become a B Corp than it is for uh, a wholesaler retailer or, or, mm -hmm. or a service um, sector organization because 
the potential for negative impact is so much greater, particularly from from energy use for energy water, and also because generally they've got they will have a supply chain. So the assessment itself is more comprehensive and more, um, yeah, it's just it's it's more difficult to achieve. So you need to have some really good environmental management um, practices and systems in place, and and some good supply chain practices as well. Uh, so. I, that may put people off um, from applying for it, but but I'm working with yeah two two equipment manufacturers at the moment, and um, and and they are they're doing well. They're on track to to get there, and uh, I think once within an industry, once once you've got a few early adopters who get it, then that helps to yeah. encourage others that okay, so I've seen them do it. I've seen that it's possible. And actually, well, now hang on a minute, that's the benchmark. So we need to be keeping up with them or trying to leapfrog them and do better than them. So it, it does take those pioneers. As to how, well, it would be B-Lab can assist um, organisations to participate. Um, I mean, they do run sector-specific webinars and uh, they have uh, sector-specific advice available on the website. Whether it goes... Whether they've got it yet for these sectors, I'm not sure. They've they've focused quite a lot on the food and drink sector, on fashion, mm. on um, on finance, um, probably on the the um, beauty and um, personal healthcare product sectors because these are all sectors that have been traditionally early adopters. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure yet whether they've moved on to kind of equipment manufacturing, but um, it's certainly something that I can feed back and say, right, you know, is there any specific targeted support available? Oh, thank you, Kate. Uh, you, you'd be happy, Gustos. Uh, seems like you guys have started the journey in your sector, so you guys are going to be influencing your peers in order to also become B Corp certified. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We've almost got a full set, actually. If you look at the big recipe box companies, they're all beagles. So. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Jeremy, then there's a question that came through for you, which was around, you know, obviously understanding that there is a need for ESG initiatives to be sort of core to the business. But at the same time, there is a need to sort of balance the need of you know, external shareholders or stakeholders and in terms of the time that the business is spending on this. So how can the prioritization take place? How should, how should a business be thinking about incorporation, but also the prioritization of time? Well, look, I, I think the reality is a lot of companies are really trying to figure out how to resource this now. Um, and where does it sit? Does it sit as it as traditionally has in sustainability? Does it mm -hmm. sit with communications marketing? Does it sit if you take specific areas of ESG in particular functions like um, HR, you know, being more involved in the S and, and to a certain extent the G? Um, they're trying to figure it out. It's really difficult. And like I say, there is a problem right now, I think, that there, particularly in the communications and marketing function, mm -hmm. there's a lack of people that really understand fully the operational side of the business, particularly when it comes to delivering against things like targets. So that's that's problematic. And I don't think there's a model yet. I think every company is really trying to figure out within their organization, how does this all fit together? I think the key thing, though, is that um, for years, sustainability was either a kind of adjunct function to strategy at best, at yeah. worst, it was very much a communication. So that's when, when people used to talk to me about the sustainability report and what I picked up was effectively a brochure with 25 case studies of things they've done well in the environment. That's mm -hmm. not sustainability reporting. So that's, that's the history of the function. Now the function needs to sit centrally mm -hmm. together with strategy because it's an operational function. But in doing so, you've got some of the peripheral corporate functions important but peripheral like comms where you've got a lot of communications professionals in there that don't truly understand what the organization is trying to deliver and okay. tying those things together and it's a lot of what our work is to try and tie these things together that's the, the critical step but in reality i don't think there's a model that fits all because um, everyone's just trying to figure it out right now perfect thank you jeremy i think we have about a minute left and the last question that i would actually put to all three panelists is your call to action I think a lot of the companies are sort of starting the journey of building their ESG credentials. So what would your what would your call to action be? Where do they start? Um, Hugh, maybe starting with you. Yeah, well, so for, for strengthening credentials, I think it's about 
focusing on the areas that are most material to you as a business and where you can have the biggest impact. Um, I touched on a, a little of the, the how of communication in this area, um, making sure that it's credible and relatable, but I'd say uh, as a call to action, do it. I mean, ESG communication is important for every aspect of business, for attracting new customers and retaining them, um, for attracting new talent. It's becoming an expectation from consumers as well. So businesses who don't have strong ESG credentials that, or are doing it in the wrong way will stand out for, for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Thank you. Kate, your call to action. Uh, am I allowed two or maybe three? Um, yeah. I, my first would be just start, do something. If you're not doing anything, like make this a priority. My second one would be decarbonize. That's got to be the priority here. I mean, everything else sort of pales into insignificance. This is a climate crisis. Yeah. Make that your focus. Um, yeah, look at what you well, look at where your carbon emissions are coming from or your carbon e emission equivalent and 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 tackle those. And then my third would be measurement, data, measurement, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Jeremy. I agree with all that. And I think you took the words out of my mouth. For me, it is about creating impact. Um, my colleagues get sick of me hearing me talk about impact all day long, but it is about that. Create it, figure out where you can create the most impact, mm -hmm. then start to create that impact, then claim some recognition for it in that order. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Hugh, Kate, and Jeremy, as well as to the attendees. I think it was a very interesting conversation with lots of interesting points. Um, we will be circulating a note coming out of the key learnings from this session with everybody in the attendees as well, um, as well as we hope that you are able to join us for the next webinar as well, which is coming up on Wednesday and relates to climate action. So thank you all for joining us and uh, speak to you soon. Thank you.